Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Kang Kyung Wa is with us. Dr. Kang has just moved to New York from Seoul, South Korea, to take over the reins of the Asia Society from Kevin Rudd, who became the Australian ambassador to the United States. She has a distinguished background as a diplomat, having served for four years as South Korea's 38th Minister of Foreign Affairs, the first woman to serve in this role in the nation's history. She previously held key roles at the United Nations and was appointed to important positions, Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights under Kofi Annan, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs under Ban Ki-moon, and Senior Advisor on Policy to Antonio Guterres. She has hit the ground running at the Asia Society, mm -hmm. and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Kang kyung Wa to the program to tell us all about it. Mm -hmm. Welcome. It's an honor for us that you're Thank here. Thank you very much, Jim. Very happy to be here. And uh, you're not a stranger to the United States or no. to New York, no. uh, even though you took this new post yeah. just this past April. So yes. tell us about your background. Well, I was here f initially five years as a South Korean diplomat with a ROK mission in New York. And, and that was in the er early part of the 2000s. And then I came back as a UN official to work in the humanitarian field, so uh, four years. For altogether, I've lived in and around the city for nearly 10 years, so it's like coming back home and really happy to be back in New York. So you're practically a New Yorker. Uh, <laughs> yes. But you were also, you were educated. Uh, you got your advanced degrees here. Oh, I, yes, well, up in Massachusetts. Yes. At the University of Massachusetts. Well, that counts. Amherst, yes. Um, so I, I, I have a bit of a red frog. Red Sox <laughs> fandom behind me. <laughs> um, but uh, I was there to study intercultural international communication for my master's and PhD. Uh, went back home and served in uh, the National Assembly for many years and then joined the foreign ministry. So I was in public service all my career, whether it's in Korea or at the UN. Now, you were the first woman mm -hmm. ever to be the foreign minister yes. of South Korea. Yes. Now, you became foreign minister after we had had Madeleine Albright yes. and uh, Condoleezza Rice yes. and Hillary Clinton. Uh, was that a difficult uh, path to take? For, yes. Uh, well, all, all uh, wonderful uh, models. Uh, in particular, Madeleine was a, as a great mentor, and, and I think I followed her leadership and and learned a great deal from her. Yes, it was. I was the first, uh, the 38th and the first. And, you know, I think I was prepared with all of my UN experience and the foreign minister experience. But it really was the political will of the president, President Moon Jae-in, who wanted 30 percent women in his initial cabinet. And not just, you know, the traditional women's portfolio in, you know, gender equality and the family, not just these light portfolio, but really heavy duty portfolios that were traditionally men led, like transportation and construction. Now, have other women uh, broken ground uh, since your tenure as, uh, as foreign not minister? Not yet. Since I left, there have been one, two, now the third. Um, you know, having been the first, you always ha have this desire. The second can't be that far. Please, you know, the second has to come, the third, fourth, so that it becomes a it becomes a routine. It hasn't happened, and this is the the big issue with you know the first women's. It takes a long time for the second women to come, um, and not not just in this position, but many other positions of leadership, and that requires a concerted effort to grow you know capable women. So now you're the leader of uh, the Asia Society. We have had a woman yes. as a past leader. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, what attracted you to this position? Well, you know, Asia, I've always known, uh, you know, Asia Society has such a wonderful reputation uh, here in New York and many other places around the world. And, and I've known Asia Society as, you know, a, an a presence in New York where wonderful things happened uh, and I have come to see many of those while I was living here uh, as part of the UN mission, UN and, and the, the Korean mission. But when I was offered uh, to try out this position, of course, I looked uh, more deeply into this. And at that point, 
having had so much more experience as foreign minister, have now having this nearly four years of uh, experience, intense experience of dealing with the, with the world uh, as a South Korean foreign minister, and then also the UN experience. I think, you know, I have the, the, the skill set to take Asia society to the next level. You know, I think Asia society is also wanting to make that leap from, you know, not just about Asia, but with Asia. Um, and I think I bring that with Asia element. Yes, Vishaka and um, uh, Josette uh, were my two women predecessors. Um, Vishaka, you know, have, we had a wonderful conversation with her. She, she is a, a great mentor. Um, but they, they're all you know, um, Americans, right? By, by, I think, you know, culturally, of course, she had a great Indian background, but the nationality of, of all of our predecessors, all of my predecessors were American or Kevin Rudd, Australian. So I think the board really wanted to go beyond that traditional mold and bring in somebody who would really say, we are now not just about Asia, but with Asia. And here I am. An Asian leader for the Asia Society. Yes. So tell us about uh, your vision for the society. What, what is it going to do that it hasn't done before? Well, first tell us uh, what has it done? It started as a museum. It is so much more than a museum now. As you know, we have a huge policy pillar, uh, which my predecessor Kevin has done a great deal to build it up. Um, and I think especially on China, we are what we, we call not just a think tank, but a think and do tank. So we don't do research in the way the traditional big research outfits do. We do research that is analytical about the policies that are being uh, devised or implemented. So we, I, I, to me, it's more policy analysis research, uh, whether it's you know, climate change or security. And then to, uh, to come out with reports with recommendations for key countries. Uh, and we do a lot of that for China, uh, uh, not only research, but also dialogue, you know, 1.5, 2.0 track dialogue that is beyond government discu discussions. So, and in fact, we're having a 1.5 uh, dialogue uh, taking place in Beijing uh, next week. So this is a series. Um, so the output in terms of the research, but also in terms of being a platform for these discussions uh, it, at a situation where the dialogue between the government, the official dialogue has been rather difficult and strained. And so we would like to provide that extra layer, additional layer of dialogue, people to people exchanges to be a part of what I would call a force for the positive side of things in this very difficult bilateral relationship. And that, that's China. But you know, it's not just China. We also have a research capacity at our center in India, for example, which looks at very closely at what's going on in India. I'd like to grow that policy focus to be more diverse, uh, to represent the full extent of Asia. So far, it is, it is not. And so I, I would like to, you know, so that when we think of Asia society, it, it immediately says, oh, we can go to Asia society to find out about what is going on in this country about what you know, climate change. So we have a what we call a climate action map for Asia, and it's interactive. And so you know it shows the map of Asia, and you click a country, and it shows you the kinds of policies, the kinds of actions that that country is taking or has committed to take on climate change. We don't have all countries covered. I think now we have uh, the key countries covered at least, but we want to expand that. So, you know, that to go, go to place where you want to find out what that country is doing in, in some of these critical issues of the day. Um, I also want to, you know, you know, re-strengthen our arts and culture pillar. As you say, it is what started Asia Society, and we have a long, long tradition and, 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 and a footprint uh, in that regard. We have a wonderful collection from the Rockefeller family, and it, it sits in our storage, very well taken care of, but I'd like to you know, pull that out uh, and, and, and have it part as a Asia Society's 
face. Uh, it's not visible very. I mean, the name Asia Society, and everybody knows that it's the, you know John D. Rockefeller the third founded it. But I'd like to bring that collection out to be a more everyday, present face of Asia Society to really remind us about you know where were our roots, but not just to stay there, but to say you know to bring in you know the arts and culture side of Asia uh, to the contemporary times, and not just but clearly indicating this is how we started and this is where we're going. We just had a wonderful uh, Asia Society Asia Arts Game Changers Award, which we ha were doing, uh, was a little bit stopped during the COVID situation, but now we came back and did a real full-fledged uh, Artist Game Changers Award uh, event this year. And we brought out five wonderful contemporary women artists with Asian roots, whether they were in their own countries or in, in as part of the Asian diaspora here in the United States, five of them, every one of them just wonderful with their own artistic space. Well, we used to think of uh, Asia as the continent of Asia, uh, mm -hmm. and immediately coming to mind uh, Korea, Japan, and of course China. Yes. Uh, now uh, people talk of the Indo-Pacific region. Yes. Yes. So it brings in India. Of course. Of uh, course. May, uh, from the point of view of Asia society, you're also bringing in the Middle East. Uh, you have outposts in Paris. Yes. Uh, yes. Pretty soon you're going to be covering the whole world. I yes. Mean, what well, are we'd the be limits? happy what to. What are the limits of Asia, no, if we, any? We also, um, you know, Asia, of course, is uh, is ASEAN, the Southeast Asian. Oh, I and left that out, of yeah, course. Yes, and of course, uh, we also have Australia. Uh, ours is what we call a franchise model. Uh, we don't say, you know, for sitting here in New York, we, we don't say, oh, we want a center there and find partners to work with there. But it is the homegrown desire to work with us, you know, because they trust the name Asia Society what Asia Society stands for and wants to do the work, you know, the same mission in that context. So we've had long-standing centers in Hong Kong, in Houston, LA, and San Francisco, and now at Japan, Korea, um, Australia, India, and we now have centers in Zurich to do what they called Asian competency for Swiss. And we now have also a center in Paris for... For the Olympics. <laughs> no, no, well, I, Olympics is too immediate. It, that's still, it's just, just getting off the ground. Uh, but it has this ambition to be the Asia Society go-to place for all of Europe. Um, so we'll see how that rolls out. So, yeah, and we welcome that desire to share our mission in the local context. And because it's locally driven, the, the kinds of programmatic activities are very local driven, and we welcome that diversity. It's a bit of a challenge bringing in about uh, the coordination. Um, but we have, we have daily, uh, I sit on some of these boards of the local centers to make sure that you know, I get a sense of what they're doing and they get a sense of where we are at headquarters. Okay, so let's talk about China because it's hard to talk about Asia without talking of about course. China. And of course, uh, people speculate endlessly about the, uh, the temperature of our relations with uh, mm -hmm. the Chinese. How do you see it? Uh, well, is it becoming more fractious or is it? Uh, you know, uh, we happen to out? have um, uh, our very, the very, you know, just top, um, diplomat as they come, uh, um, the ambassador Nicholas Burns into Asia Society yesterday for a private dinner with our, with our key trustees and other leaders, and then a public event. And, you know, he was uh, so very clear that uh, you know, U.S. China are in a systematic, systemic competition, not just for one or two years, but for a very long term. But that doesn't mean that they can. They shouldn't talk. In fact, the more competition, the more there has to be dialogue. 
And uh, after just recently, the two militaries have talked. The militaries are talking. There is there 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 experts on AI are talking. Um, there's talk on the whole issue of the fentanyl, the ingredients. So after the summit meeting in San Francisco last year, it, it you know I and we were confirmed of this uh, by the ambassador. It's been a period of stability in this bilateral relationship and. Certainly, I think the whole world very much hope that that will continue to be the case. Yeah. So competition, but you know, manage competition with dialogue because if you compete and you don't talk, you know, it could easily lead to a lot, a whole lot of misunderstanding is addressed and and confrontation. So of course, as you know, uh, Ray Dalio, who uh, operates uh, the world's largest hedge fund, yes. billionaire, uh, yeah. spoke in Hong Kong recently. Yes, and yes. He expressed a fear that the economic competition and the possible outcome of the U.S. election would lead to a deterioration of the mm -hmm. relationship, perhaps even a, a military confrontation. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree with him? I think, you know, everything is possible, mm -hmm. but everything is possible uh, to prevent because these are all the consequences of human action and human decisions. So the key is, while competing, not to let things get out of the hand and to you know, have sufficient levels of discussion so that things are managed, right? You know, I think, yes, um, the, the, especially the latest uh, issue of overcapacity in China on the electric vehicles, on, on the lithium batteries, and the solar panels and all of that has led the, the U.S. government to impose a 100% <laughs> tariff on the Chinese EVs. There are similar movements going on in other in European countries. Um, yes, that's a, you know, at the end, it's a big hurdle for companies to understand, first of all, and to work around so that they don't get in the in the crosshairs of uh, of, a, of a regulation that the American government has put in. So actually, the attitudes of the two political parties in the United States, we're now facing an election in a few mm. months, mm -hmm. uh, yes. are not that different with regard to China, are they? Well, I think broadly similar. Uh, in fact, you know, the Trump administration was keen on the trade deficit. Right, and so they they were working, you know, hard with the Chinese side to bring that, you know, deficit down. I think the Biden administration has gone on further to strengthen the, the uh, relationship with its security allies, such as Korea, such as the U.S., uh, such as Japan, and and others, Australia. So, you know, making that the U.S. acts vis-a-vis -vis China uh, in close consultation and close solidarity with the. The security allies. So I think, in a way, the Biden administration has taken that one step further beyond the economic realm. Um, and if uh, Mr. Biden continues in office, that we can expect very much that to continue. That is predictable, right? If we get a different result, uh, that it will bring about a great deal of unpredictability. And, and I think that's, you know, businessmen. The one thing that business people don't like is unpredictability. Even if tariffs, even if sanctions, if they are predictably there, they can find ways to work with it or around it, but it's the unpredictability. They like predictable sanctions. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> sanctions, you know, there are sanctions and there are sanctions. Uh, I, I, you know, I think the, the, me, the, the minute you raise the word sanction, it, it, it be, you know, as because you know, it immediately creates a sense of fear. Okay, this is going to be a problem. But I think you know, you have to understand why the sanctions are in place to begin with. Uh, some are unilateral sanctions by the by the United States. Um, you know, but there are also uh, global sanctions imposed, for example, on North Korea because of their nuclear program, and that's binding on everybody. So. Within the world of sanctions, <laughs> you, there's various kinds uh, and various le uh, levels of severity. Um, I don't agree with all of them, but I think in some cases it's absolutely necessary. Well, you brought up North Korea, and uh, when uh, Trump was president, mm -hmm. uh, he met with uh, Kim Jong-un three times. Yes. Uh, and when he said he was going to meet with him the first time, he mm -hmm. sort of uh, did it very quickly, and mm -hmm. as foreign minister, you were yes. somewhat surprised at the uh, 
uh, celerity with which he moved, uh, mm -hmm. but you were optimistic. Did he accomplish anything with the three meetings? Well, the first one in Singapore was, I think, because it was the first, and there was a bit of a drama before that, because in the weeks leading up to the, the Singapore summit, the North Koreans, uh, one of their officials said something nasty about vice president, I think. So Mr. Pre uh, Trump said, in that, you know, this is unacceptable, we're not going to do this. So, <laughs> and, and then uh, at, I think Kim Jong-un was taken aback, so he contacted my president and asked to meet my president at the DMZ. So, in fact, that was their second encounter. And we did, he did this very quietly. He didn't announce it. We only announced it afterwards. But after, after um, that meeting, a uh, short meeting, uh, we then talked to the, uh, I, I talked to Mr. Pompeo and conveyed the outcome of that conversation. And that convinced them to, okay, then we will have the summit meeting. So the summit meeting was uh, of historic first of the U.S. president meeting, the leader of North Korea. It came out with broad agreements, not concrete action points, but broad pillars uh, uh, that North Korea will denuclearize, uh, that, the, that, with, that U.S. and, and uh, North Korea will work towards a better relations. Uh, they, the fourth point, I think, was that they will cooperate to um, to find uh, the remains of the soldiers during the Korean War times. So, and now the, other, the fourth, the, there was four points. So it was a broad points of agreement, uh, which would be the foundation of the preparation for the n second summit meeting in Hanoi, right? Um, I, I, I think we would have liked that to be a little bit more concrete. Um, but it, you know, we were very happy that it had happened, and we were very supportive of that. Um, the, of course, then things fell, that, you know, broke apart in Hanoi when that agreement um, didn't lead to anything further more concrete. Uh, the North Koreans wanting security guarantees on the uh, on, from the Americans and sanctions relief, and the Americans wanting North Korea's more concrete, more expansive commitment to do away with their nuclear program. So the talks broke down, and that was the end of that. They, the leaders met briefly again in the DMZ that summer, um, but it was just a brief encounter. Uh, and, you know, it, that's, that's truly regrettable that we've uh, missed that opportunity to, um, you know, it, it, we, whatever, whatever was the difficulty of reaching an agreement in, in Hanoi, you know, I think in hindsight, it would have been so much, we would find ourselves in a so much better situation if the talks continued. I know the d domestic environment in the U.S. was difficult. Uh, Kim Jong-un probably felt very embarrassed and humiliated uh, after Hanoi. Um, but somehow that, that, that dynamic, that momentum for dialogue had to continue. And uh, quickly, because we're coming to the end, but uh, Korea, Japan. Yes. Uh, there has been a great deal of uh, difficulty in the relationship mm -hmm. because of uh, the issue of the comfort women mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. uh, failure of Japan properly to apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, but lately, there seems to have been a thaw in relations. Uh, uh, can you comment on that? Um, so there is the his issue of the history past history is, is not, has not gone away and is still there. I very much hope that at some point it will be squarely dealt with so that there can be true, you know, real genuine trust. Well, we had a writer stuff. named William Faulkner who said, uh, the past is not dead, it's not even past. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we are. Uh, so I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, will Asia society be helpful in forging a new relationship between the United States and uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region? I, yes, I, as I say, there are so many ways we do that work um, to, you know, I, you know, to reinforce, to strengthen the forces for peace, to strengthen the forces to that ameliorates against. Uh, the confrontational uh, elements. Uh, Indo-Pacific, yeah, oh, we're doing a lot between the United States and China. Um, we've, you know, we do a lot, um, uh, I think, 
for for uh, with India, we we um, our policy analysis is not as deep as we do for China, but I, I can see us playing that role as a dialogue facilitator in many other many other uh, you know pockets of dispute potential confrontation um, and you know I think we have that credibility I think we have the confidence of um, key players throughout the region to, for them to be able to come to us say you know be be the be the not necessarily mediator because but at least a, a, a platform for for dialogue and and we're ready to do that anytime. Asia society is ready at any time. Yes, yes, <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. Minister Kong, thank you so much for coming by. This has just been wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, be well and all the best.